So I will start, but the school nevoy is on his way. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Konst Academy of Solem for this concluding program of the Tel Aviv Days. We started two weeks ago with Bauhaus 100. Last week we had a wonderful program about film and today literature and literature uh, with uh, three of Israel's finest um, writers, authors, less well known in Sweden, but all of them are translated into many languages. Uh, Asaf Gavron is the only one who is translated into Swedish, uh, which you can get, cannot even get it at Natural Culture anymore, but at ebook if you are interested. And we hope when we do these types of programs with Israeli writers who are not translated into Swedish, of course, our ambition is that, uh, that they will be translated into Swedish. Um, my name is Lizzie Shea, I'm the director of Yudis Kultur Isveria that has curated, organized, and financed the Tel Aviv Days. Uh, at the stage here is Ricky Neumann, who will, a writer and journalist, who will co-moderate the discussion with Professor Nissim Calderon. Nissim Calderon, you may remember, he's been here a few times before. Uh, he uh, moderated the, the talk Rock and Identity in connection with Israel 60s, 60 in, at Banch. He also um, uh, was uh, participated in the Transformation of Memories, Jewish Perspectives, also at Banch in connection with Raoul Wallenberg, 100 years. And we are happy to have Nisim with us here um, today. And next to Nisim is Noah Yedlin. Noah is also um, a well-known writer, uh, the recipient of the Sapir Prize in Israel. He's like the man booker of Israel. Uh, and also is gone. I'm sorry. What the hell? Uh, and also um, a writer of a few um, books. No, Noah, did I say Yael? No. Okay, I got confused. Okay. Uh, and also she did a, a, pro a program, a TV show based on her book Stockholm. Uh, is running on television, and you will see a short um, short passage out of that um, series, and we very interesting to know why she called it Stockholm also, so that will be very interesting. Uh, Asaf Gavon, as I said, Asaf uh, is um, translated into many languages, among them Swedish, and um, you will be able also to, uh, he was here a few years ago, 2015, and we had a great discussion at Kultur Huset, and uh, this is something also that you could discuss with him later on. Eshkol Nevo, again, one of our finest writers. Eshkol also is the co-founder of the biggest creative writing school in Tel Aviv. Uh, that's a, a very important uh, institution. Um, after the intermission, uh, we will have a discussion with them, and you will be able to interact with them. Uh, and after the intermission, we, we invite you, of course, this is the concluding program, so you are all invited for coffee and, and bull and discuss with the writers. And after which, we will show uh, the first part of the iconic film about Tel Aviv of uh, David Perlov. And we'll have a discussion with his daughter, filmmaker and uh, professor at Tel Aviv University, Yael Perlov, who is here, not on stage, but with us. So we hope that you will have a meaningful afternoon which will shed a light on the life in Tel Aviv and in Israel now, facing the elections and facing the Eurovision Song Contest. So there are a lot of things going on there. Uh, thank you very much and have a good discussion. Okay, good afternoon. Thank Lizzie, uh, and thank you for coming. It's nice to be in Stockholm again. You're a very elegant city, I must say. <laughs> um, let me just begin very shortly saying that Tel Aviv was founded at 1909 uh, as a Jewish uh, suburb of Jaffa. At 1947, when the War of Independence broke, one third of all Jews lived in Tel Aviv. One third. 200,000 people out of 600,000. Yet, 
uh, Tel Aviv was the center of cultural life, commercial life, economic life, uh, military life, yet we have many writers living in Tel Aviv, but very few writing about Tel Aviv. I'll just mention something that maybe you know. I understand that here in the Swedish uh, culture, you know, because there are many translations of our three great writers, Amos Oz, Aleph Bet Yoshua, and David Grossman, none of them wrote seriously about Tel Aviv. It is mentioning, you know, just in a sentence. Uh, it's only this generation, the younger generation, that is writing extensively about Tel Aviv. Now, I will just say two sentences of explanation. Tel Aviv was important for Jewish life because Jerusalem was the city that we inherited from the past. Tel Aviv was the new city that we began. The, the modern Jew, the national Jew, not necessarily always the religious Jew, made as a new thing. This new thing was not easy culturally because the ideals of most Israelis at that time was that the modern Jew will do agriculture, that the modern Jew will live in nature. So we had a lot of writing about kibbutzim, we had a lot of writing about going to, to nature. Even if you lived in Tel Aviv, you had a problem, how would you write about this city which is not according to our ideal of the Jew coming back to nature and going to agriculture. There's another thing. When it comes to Kibbutzim, when it comes to Jews that lived outside Tel Aviv, basically, basically in rural areas, it was very organized. The organization looked, took care of building a kibbutz, building a moshav, building even some rural areas. Nobody took care of building Tel Aviv. It was private. My grandfather came, he was a shoemaker, he opened a very small shop to make shoes, and he was in Tel Aviv. Nobody organized it. This special quality of Tel Aviv, in addition to being new, and in addition to being problematic to the modern Jew, is something that I would like to put as a beginning. Please. So, okay, so let's hear from our writers. How do you see Tel Aviv and how do you integrate Tel Aviv into your literature? Noah. Um, well, first of all, I think that it works. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I think that I use Tel Aviv, I have wrote extensively a whole book about Jerusalem, or at least that um, takes place in Jerusalem, and everyone mistakes me for a Jerusalemite, and I encourage this mistake. You love Jerusalem. Because I love Jerusalem, <laughs> so I don't care. But um, later I wrote also about uh, Tel Aviv, and, and uh, funny enough, Stockholm is about Tel Aviv. <laughs> it takes place in Tel Aviv. And I feel that um, I use Tel Aviv as the place where, where the people are the first ones to go through changes in society, to, through modern changes, changes that later catch up with the rest of the population. I think it's a it's a process that happens, of course, everywhere. There's also, usually it's, um, it's, uh, it's a group of uh, high socioeconomic uh, status. Um, you know, for example, um, uh, homosexual marriages, all, all kinds of, or single, single parenting, all these things that are now more and more common in more and more layers of the population, but they usually start in big cities and in modern cities. 
And I think especially in, uh, specifically in Stockholm, uh, in Stockholm the novel, not the city, um, there, it's, there are five uh, characters. There are five 70 year old people, which I feel um, that are, I hope, they represent a bit more accurately um, the modern 70 year old people. I think that literature often, um, often is behind on reality because it takes time to write literature. So it takes time to find uh, proper representations of social phenomena in, in the books. And I feel that still in literature, old people are all, not old people, but, but older people are um, often depicted as grandparents, as warm grandparents, and all very um, stereotypical depiction of, uh, of this age as, as, um, as of right now in uh, Israel and I'm sure all over the world, there is a certain layer of 70 and even older uh, people that go on Facebook and go on Tinder and get uh, and get divorced and cheat and go abroad <laughs> and to make a long story short they they're not home uh, yearning for a call from their grandchildren but they are out there living their lives and they sometimes live their lives more vigorously than people like me who are <laughs> stuck at home with little children. They no longer have little children. <laughs> Their children are old. They sometimes have the money and the time. And, uh, and you know, this is their time to miss up for, to make up for all, their, uh, all, the, all the things that they haven't achieved yet. So for me, this, I think this is Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv but I'll interrupt where, you. Yes. Your last novel is about Jaffa. Not about Tel Aviv. It's about Israel that left Tel Aviv. Why? That's true. <laughs> well, it's, um, <laughs> why? I, I think again. It's very expensive. <laughs> isn't it? Very expensive. <laughs> um, my last novel is about a couple that uh, purchases an apartment in a very, very bad uh, area of Tel Aviv. Um, it's about gentrification, actually, which is also a process which is, I think, worldwide. And again, I think in Tel Aviv it's represented very strongly because uh, in Tel Aviv, which is the most expensive city in Israel to live in and to buy a house in, uh, more and more people look, look for, they, they crave to live in Tel Aviv, but they can't live in Tel Aviv. So they, so they go to the outskirts of Tel Aviv and they conquer more and more neighborhoods uh, which were poor and which inhabited um, work immigrants and very low um, social uh, social um, inhabitants, but uh, now they are conquered by uh, the higher socioeconomical groups, and um, I, I think this is for me Tel Aviv. It's 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 where things happen first, okay. and then it starts happening all over. I'll the just place. say to the audience that outside of Tel Aviv, it's trouble. So listen, no, I, yeah. I want to interrupt you because you know I'm in charge of the Swedish questions, okay? So, so in many Israeli circles, we know that Sweden has a low status because of many things, including the recognition of Palestine, the fire at the synagogue in Gothenburg, the anti-Semitism in Malmö, certain statements by our foreign minister. So I'm curious, did you have any hesitation when you named your novel Stockholm? <laughs> Uh, I want to say something in general about uh, titles of novels. I think that titles of novels is a huge mystery and no one can predict which title will be successful or appealing or unsuccessful or unappealing. I think that if Dostoevsky would have come to me to consult before uh, publishing Crime and Punishment, I would have strongly advised against it. I would have said no one will buy this, it's a horrible name. So, you know, it's uh, difficult to predict. Yet, um, I tend, maybe I'm doing a, a huge mistake, but I tend to trust my reader's intelligence. And um, I felt that they would appreciate, or I hoped that they would appreciate the um, huge gap or even contradiction 
between the um, aroma of the word Stockholm, which has this uh, cool and you know cold and very European and very um, like high high end uh, aroma to it. Thank and you. And the fact you're welcome. <laughs> And, um, and the fact that the book actually takes place in humid, in vulgar, in uh, a very, very, um, a very, very warm, warm in every sense, Tel Aviv. And everything there is very, very emotional. And there is envy, and there is anger, and there is all these unelegant emotions, un-Stockholmite emotions. <laughs> And it's still called Stockholm because Stockholm is like, I, I, I felt that because the, the people in the book are, this is their new Zion, you know? This is like where they look up to because in, in the book they look up to Stockholm. Let's say something. Asab Gavron, please. No? Yes. No, I just want to say, I, I have it, it's working, it's working. Um, the image of, of Sweden or of Stockholm is, is, is not what you described for most Israelis. It, we have this idea of these superhumans who build the, the perfect cars, the perfect furniture, they write the perfect pop songs. So this is how we see Stockholm. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, so that's... that's um, the title of the book, it's, 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 it's about that. It's not, it's not about any negative emotion. Can I go on yes, about, uh, about book titles? Because it reminds me, in, in reference to Tel Aviv, that actually the name Tel Aviv is, is the book title. Because the, the whole... I'll go back. Um, the, the Zionism, the idea of Jews coming to Israel and building a state, started with with Theodor Herzl, a, a Viennese a doctor, and he was also a writer and a playwright. And he wrote this book, Alt Neuland, Old New Land, which Eshkol actually referred to in one of his novels, nothing to do with Tel Aviv. But um, when it was first translated to Israel, to Hebrew, it was translated by uh, Nahum Sokolov, who was also a Zionist and a, and a, <clears throat> a writer. And he gave it the name Tel Aviv. That's where the, the name came from. Um, it's not exactly old new land, Tel Aviv, but it is. The word Tel is, is like ruins or historical uh, uh, remains, and then Aviv is spring. So, so actually the name Tel Aviv is the name of a book. It started with a book which is actually a science fiction book that predicted Israel. So already we are in, in an interesting literary and, and urban uh, connection there. Should I go on about my own? Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for hijacking. Uh, no. um, I'm, I, I mean, I, I always look at Tel Aviv as an outsider. I grew up in a village near Jerusalem. And you, you have, well, Jerusalem is, is, is Lizzie, that's the next, I don't know where you are, that's the next uh, project because Jerusalem is a whole different story, but uh, Jerusalemites usually are patriotic about it, but also have a lot of problems with it. Well, I can talk about myself, I don't want to talk for others, but out of this patriotic side, I always hated Tel Aviv. And I hated the football teams from Tel Aviv, I still do. And uh, all the, you know, this, this being the, 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 the center, the proper, the high culture. And we liked this underground, underground feeling of Jerusalem a bit. Um, and I also, first time I moved to Tel Aviv, I failed. I, le I left after, after one month. I moved into a, an apartment with a friend. I don't talk to him now for 20 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I went back to Jerusalem and then I tried again and, and eventually I succeeded but I think the initial, the initial uh, uh, attraction and, and distrust come from this being an outsider 
pushing back. But then eventually, I did write about it in, 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 different, in different stories and novels. Um, I also edited a collection of stories called Tel Aviv Noir, which is a collection of supposedly noir stories, but more, more about the dark side of Tel Aviv by different writers. I co-edited with, with Edgar Keret. And, um, and then my latest novel that was published in, in Hebrew, 18 Strokes, uh, the, the, actually the narrator of the story is a taxi driver in Tel Aviv, and he has a, a book, a, a street book, a street guide in his glove compartment, and between rides he reads it because he's interested in the stories behind, behind the names of the streets, all the, the different um, you know, names of Zionist leaders or foreign uh, uh, leaders uh, and so on, and he tells his passengers these stories. Uh, but I think the, I'll just say uh, one short thing about this Asaf, I'll the story, you. I'll the story you. I'll from Tel Aviv. I'll interrupt you. I asked Asaf and the others to send me pieces of literature that they wrote about Tel Aviv. Now I'll tell the audience. Asaf wrote me, and sent me a story which takes place in Dizigov Center, which is the most popular shopping mall in Tel Aviv. And believe it or not, it is a detective story about a dead body that is cut into six or seven pieces. And all parts of the pieces are all over this of center, up, down, here. Is it a story of hatred of Tel Aviv? Does it say that Tel Aviv is a dangerous place? No, I think that's what, exactly what I was going to, to say. Um, it's dangerous as, as any big city, but I think that Dizengoff Center, in a sense, encapsulates the different worlds, uh, or some of the, uh, many of the different worlds that you see in Tel Aviv, because you have, um, you have the shopping center. And even in the shopping center, you have the big brand names, the glamorous names, and then you have these little alleys with tattoo parlors <laughs> and, uh, and the more dodgy kind of further parts of, of the center. And then another part of the Dizengoff Center is, uh, is an office building, 24 floors. I know that because I once worked on the 23rd floor. And it's like lawyers and high tech and all this side of Tel Aviv. Also overlooking the beach with be beautiful, the whole seashore. And then you have, um, you have underground, you have the floors underground. And there are fascinating stories, I won't get into that, but one thing that I, that I did uh, do is I, I did a boxing, I did boxing in one of those little stinky places under the ground, and it's all Russian kids. So that's another Tel Aviv word that is fascinating. And there's even, the last thing I would say, there's even a connection to the security army part side of Israel, which is um, that there, there is a rumor that is, there is an underground tunnel going from Dizengoff Center, from the very bottom of Dizengoff Center, to the Kirya, which is the, the central army base in, in the heart of Tel Aviv, where the chief of staff sits. <laughs> so there's even that. It's good. Okay, you, Tel Aviv. I, I also, uh, can you hear me? I also have memories from Dizengoff Center. I will, I will share soon, but I wanted to, the headline of my talk today was, why did it take me 20 years to fall in love with Tel Aviv? So I have to say, uh, to, to begin with, that it took me two hours to fall in love with, with Stockholm. Oh. That quick. Uh, and with Tel Aviv, it was more complicated because I grew up in, uh, in Haifa and in Jerusalem, and when we came to Tel Aviv, and there's a scene uh, in my book, in the World Cup, World Cup Wishes, uh, uh, which is based on, on my experience, when we came to Tel Aviv, and we went to Dizengoff Center, we got lost. <laughs> I remember <laughs> being 16, not, you know, not nine or 10, 16, getting lost in Dizengoff Center, going to the information booth and asking them to call my name <laughs> that my friends would, would be able to find me. Another thing that always struck me about people from Tel Aviv when I was 
16, 17, and then in the army, people from Tel Aviv would never add, when they told uh, you their, their phone number, and I'm talking about the pre-cellular era, every area in Israel had this, his, his, its own, uh, how do you say, promotion, kidomet, area, area code, area code. So if you were from Haifa, you would say 04. If you were from Jerusalem, you would say 02. If you were from Tel Aviv, you would not say, <laughs> because we are the center of the world. <laughs> of course, you know, that's the number. You don't need this area code. So when I was growing up, uh, Tel Aviv seemed like, like fiction to me, in a way. Um, world Cup Wishes begins with a scene. It's, it's four friends, there are four friends. And it's 1998, it's the World Cup final. And they are writing uh, wishes. Uh, they decide to write three wishes and to find out uh, after four years, in the next World Cup final, were they able to fulfill their wishes. And they find out that they have to move to Tel Aviv to actually fulfill their wishes. And that was the other side of growing up in Haifa or in Jerusalem. We were afraid from Tel Aviv, but we were also attracted to it. Because if you wanted to be a writer, if you wanted to be a musician, if you wanted to work in advertising, if you wanted to be a big lawyer, Tel Aviv was the place to be. So eventually I got to Tel Aviv when I was 20 something. Still, and that's what's happening to the, the characters in the book also in World Cup Wishes, they cling to each other. They, they, have, they, they maintain this Haifa friendship because they don't really understand these Tel Avivian guys. They seem to know something that we do not know. <laughs> they understand something about the world but, that we are still learning. <laughs> so that was my feeling about Tel Aviv when I was 20-something. This kind of a alienation and attraction combined. And then it changed. And it changed, and it changed because, of, uh, because of politics in a strange way. I remember the moment I fell in love with Tel Aviv, and it was during the 2011 uh, uh, social demonstrations we had, uh, the social protests, uh, the tents, the city. By the way, how, how many of you have been in Tel Aviv? Raise your hand. Wow. Oh, oh my God. Okay, so Rothschild Boulevard, yes. 2011, uh, a, a one girl that cannot find a flat in Tel Aviv, Daphne Leaf, uh, puts on a tent and she says, that, People in Israel, young people in Israel cannot live here. It's unaffordable. And then after two days, there are five tens, and then ten, and then thousands of tens. And this, and this was the moment I fell in love with Tel Aviv. I was involved in this, in this protest. And I think this was the moment I understood that Tel Aviv has talked about uh, Alt Neuland, about this, this, the, the vision of Herzl. The moment I understood that Tel Aviv is now the only place in Israel where, where the original ver uh, vision of Herzl is realized, or at least someone is trying to realize it. And when I think about the recent two or three years in Israel, the demonstrations uh, against the law discriminating uh, homosexuals and lesbians, the demonstrations against the national law, the, which is discriminating Arabs, the demonstrations against the loyalty and culture law, they were all held in Tel Aviv. So now, Tel Aviv for me has become a center of resistance uh, to, to current politics in Israel. So, so it took me 20 years to fall in love, but now I, I, I feel it's, it's the place where, where good things could, could happen, can start for, for our country. Okay, thank you, Eshko. So we have to squeeze in another Swedish question. A Swedish reader of Israeli literature will have to face three giants. I mean, most of the fiction that was translated was fiction by Aleph Beit, Yoshua, David Grossman, and Amos Oz. They dominated the Israeli fiction here. And I'm curious to find out, were you dominated? What is your relationship to these three giants? If you could say something short, you know, because you all belong to a different generation. Amos Oz was my teacher in Abel Sheva University, and uh, I'm still in a way mourning uh, his death. He, he died uh, a couple of weeks ago, months. And I appreciated him a lot. He was a very generous person. But I wouldn't say uh, 
as a writer, I felt dominated by, or as a generation we feel dominated by, we are inspired by these writers. Uh, we appreciate them. Uh, they're all great writers, even if you compare them to other you know, writers in the, around the world. But no, uh, I, I, I felt, as, as a writer, uh, more influenced the, uh, the, from cinema, from music, from writers from my own generation, like Edgar Keret. Uh, when Asaf uh, was coming to Tel Aviv, uh, he, he edited a book called Ototo, which is a collection of short stories. And I remember myself as a, as a youngster, 23 years old, reading this collection of short stories and thinking to myself, I want to do this, I want to write, and I, but I want to do it differently. So, uh, so if, if you talk about influences, I, I, I don't, I don't oh, feel okay. that so we are me, dominated. Okay. I can say, I so can Esco, say let, let me put a follow-up question. Yeah. Because I've interviewed these three people many, many times here in Sweden, and every meeting, did end in sort of the same way. There was a certain amount of preaching. Preaching? Yeah, there was mm -hmm. a certain amount. These are important lessons. Mm. And behind it, you felt a deep responsibility in regard to Israel. And you felt as if these three people were part of an ongoing building of the nation, that they were sort of ambassadors. And I'm curious, do you feel any kind of responsibility of this kind? Responsibility is a big word. I would say I, I feel attached. I feel I care. I, and I feel triggered by, by the Israeli story, by the Israeli uh, 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 way of life. I think one of the most magnificent things in being an, uh, an Israeli writer is that it's a paradise for storytellers. You just have to go to the street and then you see there's this new mikveh, which is built for the Russian immigrants who are 70 years old. And, and then you think, why did they build the mikveh for Russian immigrants 70 years old? Who, who made the decision? And then you have a story. Oh, you have a novel already happening in your mind. So I, I, I care about my country. I write political essays and in Idiot Echronot. I'm looking forward for the upcoming elections. Maybe we'll have a change after many years that we hadn't. But I, when I write, I don't feel I'm an, an ambassador of nothing. I, I'm, I, I feel that I'm loyal to my characters, to what I, I want to express. Okay, so Noah, I saw that you were nodding. Do you want to add something? Uh, well, I, first of all, as, as for these three great writers, I feel that they influenced me in two ways. Um, the first is that these are the people I read at the time that I was learning to read. Not learning to read as a six-year-old, but learning to read as a 15-year-old, as a 16-year-old. Um, so these are the people that I, I read. So these are the people that in one way or another, they go through my veins and they're there to stay. Uh, they taught me in a way, what is, what is literature? What is a book? What is writing? What is telling a story? Um, so in a way, they are responsible to who I am, as others are, as others that I read and the others that I liked. And another way that they influenced me, which I think is more important even, and I think Eshkol touched it uh, slightly, is uh, the fact that I had, I had uh, very short interactions with all of them, all kinds of interactions, and I think they showed me how to behave generously when you are very successful. And this is something that I was so overwhelmed by, by the by the by the warmth and by the generosity and by the way that they care about younger writers and they read, they care to read younger writers. It's really important to them. And if they like something, they bother to make sure that the person knows that they liked it, which for a young writer is, you cannot, uh, you cannot emphasize enough how important that is. And 
I really took a mental note saying that this is the way to behave. Okay, thank you. So, Asaf, you want to add something? Yes, quickly. Um, actually, I grew up in, in, a, in a home, in an English home. My parents were immigrants from England, and they, I think they didn't know the Israeli culture very well or the Israeli writers. So the, book I, the books I got were, you know, English and American classics like Mark Twain and stuff like that. Um, and actually, I grew up resenting a little bit the Israeli stories. I was more interested, uh, um, Shkol mentioned different influences. One of the things he said, younger uh, uh, writers from our generation from different countries, for me, those were the ones. They wrote about, I felt that they wrote about my life, like English, Scottish, American writers, um, I felt more, more closer to, to their stories than to these Z giant Zionistic ones. And my first books were, were, didn't even take place, my first three books did not take place in Israel. They had Israeli characters, but I had this idea that I'm part of this more global generation. Then in my fourth book, I, I totally came back, and, and since then I actually write a lot about the Israeli story and the, the political situation and, and things like that. Um, having said that, um, I of course over the years did read and do appreciate it and, and I have to, to agree, after Amos Oz's death, there were lots and lots of and, and, you know, obituaries in, in the press and stories and every, it seemed like hundreds of people and writers told their story about how they got a letter from Amos Oz in his show, with his handwriting. So I also got a letter like that, which was very exciting and, and uh, moving and, and, and generous. Um, and he, he did, as, as Noah said, he, he, at least I know about him, he did see it as his role to, uh, to be a mentor to the young, to younger writers and to read and to write. I, I simply don't know how, how he had the time to read all the books that were sent to him, but apparently he did. Uh, but a word about being an ambassador myself outside of Israel, it's, 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 a, tough, it's a tough question. I mean, I, I mean, as we just said, I think we need to be humble. We don't, you know, we're not elected to any any office, and we were not um, uh, been given uh, an official role. But I do see it as a point to show in Israel that, in at least in recent years, the official uh, Israel, uh, you know, people who have the, the official roles are not showing. They are showing in Israel that, for me, is wrong and aggressive and intolerant. And if I can do in a short event, in a small event in, in Stockholm with 100 people or anywhere else that, where I travel with my books, if I can show a different voice, then, then I, I want to do it. I, I, I don't know if it influences anyone, but I, I want to know that, peop that people know that there is a different Israel to what they see. Uh, in, in the headline. Thank you. So let me ask you a follow-up question. When you, I talked to these three giants, there was a, you know, a complaint that, were, that grew stronger and stronger over the years. And that was whenever they wrote something that wasn't political, it was interpreted as political. Is that something you can recognize? In other words, coming from Israel, you have to have a political point of view. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very long discussion um, among Israeli writers. There are a lot of people who really resent that need from outside that every book must be political. I, you know, I can tell my story. I had a book published, um, my most successful book ever until today in Israel was called Moving and it was about Israeli movers in America. And it was a bestseller in Israel nothing political, and they never managed to sell it abroad. And then my next book was a failure in Israel, but it was about the period of the suicide bombings, and, and uh, it, had, it was totally about 
about the, the situation, and, and it sold to, you know, 10 languages and did very well and won prizes all, of, all over the world. Now, you look at it and you say, you know, it's like we're expected, we're one trick pony, we can only write about that, otherwise they're not interested in us. And it is, it is, um, it is frustrating in a way. On the other hand, as Eshkol said, uh, at least I see the, the political situation as an amazing playground to work with, so I am interested. But if someone is not, he just wants to write about, about you know, families and love and, and, and Tel Aviv and, and without the politics, then why shouldn't they be uh, uh, interesting to, to global audiences like, like an English writer writes about love and, and London? I think, I think a novel is, is never about one topic. Always it has multiple layers. And a book can be about the social uh, uh, demonstrations in Israel in 2011, and it can be at the same time about loneliness, about marriage, about the need to confess to someone. It's, uh, and every reader can find in his own way of reading, the way of interpreting the book. Now, sometimes it can be frustrating that you have written this whole novel with a lot of layers, and there's a, an interview, and the first question is, what do you think about the situation in Gaza? Which is not relevant to your book in any way. <laughs> but, but mostly I find that, you know, uh, uh, as, as Noah said, readers are, are intelligent, they, they notice the fact that when we are writing about political conflicts and social issues, we are writing about them through stories, through emotions, through relationships. That people realize that. And less and less, I think, I get these kind of questions. I get this, this kind of feeling that uh, a, an Israeli writer has to write about political issues to be recognized. I don't, I don't believe it's true anymore. The need to write it is personal. It's not re uh, related to the way it is perceived or perceived. I want to add, uh, I want to continue uh, Eshkol's words. I feel even more strongly that literature uh, lives and nourishes from the private, from the personal and from the private. And Amos Oz's and Grossman's and Alfred Joshua's as well. They have written a lot of political uh, things that are considered political, but these would never have been successful as they are if they did not have characters in them which are human beings. No, no difference between uh, literary characters and human beings. These are lucky enough or unlucky enough to be born in a book and not in the real life, but it's the same. And um, I think that n this is where good literature sits, in the private and in the personal. This is what allows good literature and it allows it to be recognized worldwide because we all, no matter, be, uh, under the layers, under the politics, under the circumstances, under the plot even, the plot is just a hanger to hang the human emotions over. Under everything, we all have our souls, and in these souls we have the exact same emotions, and it, it has to be, there has to be truth there. Everything else, in my opinion, is circum circumstantial. Maybe I can add something here, which is in a way, in a way, a kind of disagreement with Noah, but in a way, agreement with uh, what we heard from Asaf and uh, Eshkol. You know, I asked uh, Edgar Keret, that was mentioned here, what do you feel about these three giants? He said in his, in his semi-comical way, he said, you know, Amos Oz and me are going to the same demonstration, but Amos is going to speak from the stage, and I'm going to stay in the audience. Now, this means not only that I don't want to speak like a prophet, more than that. Amos, which was a great writer, and Joshua, and Grossman, live deep down with the feeling that there is one big Israeli story. And they accept or disaccept or, 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 or have argument with it, 
while I think that the young generation basically know that Israeli society is deeply divided. We are a society in trouble. We are a society that does not accept that there are no one story. That basically there are many stories and if I would follow a school, go to the street and I'll take the stories, they do not combine to one story. Therefore, in a way, they are reflecting a more humble way, a more humane voice, and a more troubled society, I, I, according to my feeling. Uh, any other one? Well, I, I, uh, I want to add something that is connected to what you said, Nisim. Uh, I, for a while, I am the editor of the Swedish Jewish Chronicle, and in the next issue, we have a piece by Gideon Levy, and, and this is hard to believe, this is a very upbeat piece. This is a piece where he's not critical in regard to Israel, on the contrary, yeah. And why? Because he's referring to a soccer game when the Israeli national team beat Albania in Haifa, and most of the players were Arab Israelis. And we beat Albania, we didn't be beat Spain. <laughs> Any, or Sweden. <laughs> anyway, to him, to him, this simple fact is extremely uplifting. And I'm curious to find out, is there anything like that going on in the world of literature? <laughs> Eshkol, eh? Okay. <laughs> Arab players. Let's try to take the metaphor of football to... Um, I, I, as as uh, Lizzie mentioned before, I, I co-run the biggest creative writing uh, school in Israel. So I can tell you, looking at the, the texts of my students, and I've been teaching for 20 years now, so you can see the, a process there, that the new voices are coming into our literary scene. Some of them are not yet published, because they're, they're young, and they're developing as writers, but uh, starting from two or three years ago, we have the followers of Syed Kashua, like Arab Israelis writing in Hebrew or in Arabic. Some of them female, uh, female writers in, in Arab, Arabic and in Hebrew for the first time. Uh, we have the second generation of the Russian immigrants telling their story, their special story. We have, they write in Hebrew, yeah. Uh, after the first generation has, has preferred writing in, in Russian. Uh, we have people coming from the periphery, periphery of Israel, we, and, and, and people are willing, I guess, to write about the army in a different way they haven't written before, about army experience, uh, about being a soldier and the, the PTSD aspect of it. So you can see new voices and new stories coming into, into our uh, discussion. We st I still cannot say that the, um, the team of Israeli writers is has five, uh, ha five Arab Israelis uh, dominating it, but uh, I think you feel, it's, I think it's, it's a more democratic scene than it used to be. When we, talk, we mentioned uh, Amos Oz and, and uh, Aleph Bet Yoshua, I think, when you were writing in the 70s or in the 80s in Israel, you had to write in a very specific Hebrew, the literary Hebrew. By the way, I don't know how it goes in Sweden, do you have to write in a, in, a, in a specific level of Swedish to be published? But I think this changed, and it changed for the good. You have this big span now of, of okay. Hebrew and the way you, you use Hebrew. Uh, and I think it's more, it, it's, it has democratized the whole, the whole uh, writing uh, scene in Israel. Okay, thank you. So Asaf, you want to say something? I'll say something about that. <clears throat> I mean, the beautiful thing about football is that it, it, um, it's a very simple game and, and it brings and, and it has very um, simple rules and you need to play well with your, with your foot. Um, the main difference with literature and your head as well, but in literature already you have the barrier of language. That's already... A, 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 a decision, a question for an Arab writer. Sayed Kashua, who has been the, the most successful uh, Israeli Arab writer in the last 10, 15 years, 
Um, he, he writes in Hebrew. He went to uh, high school in, in uh, Hebrew language, Israeli school in Jerusalem. And um, that's his first language of writing, Hebrew is. But by making this de decision, he already um, kind of created some controversy in the Arab society with some of the Israeli Arabs and, of course, non-Israeli Arabs already resenting that decision because he writes in Hebrew. Um, if, however, they choose to write in Arabic, then they have a, a barrier to break into the Israeli reading public in Israel. There is a, a wonderful writer um, who wrote about Akko. No, Ayman. He wrote a book in Arabic first about the history of, of Akko. It's a novel about Akko, the, the, uh, the, the city. And, uh, and then it was translated to Hebrew. And it was published in Hebrew, and it was uh, nominated for, for Sapir recently, and so on. Um, and, and, but, but again, he had to go through this, this decision of first writing in Hebrew, then finding a publisher to translate it. It's, it's, so it's much harder. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to hear uh, Eshkol say, who is an authority about the upcoming voices, because his school is producer, produces now for four years the uh, new voices. Okay, that thanks, there are many thank you, coming. thank you. And I don't know, Noah, you want to add something? First of all, you lost me at soccer, so oh. I, uh, but no, I think they did a good job. I, I want to ask, I want to ask a question, okay? You've been asking questions all the time. I'm still astonished by the amount of people here who have been in Tel Aviv. What is the Swedish fascination about Tel Aviv? What is it? Is it, the, is it the weather? Is it the history? <laughs> you know, maybe I will you know, ask, you know, ask somebody in the audience to answer. But, you know, it's the weather, it's the history, it's the different dimensions. It's an open society. You can walk around at night without being, you know, scared. And uh, I also think it's the intensity. I also think there is a sense of conflict. There's a sense of aggression. You know, the way people drive, there's something going on. There is so much happening inside those cars, inside those heads, and so on. But I think it's time to ask you all this if you are present. Do you have any questions? To the panel. Two questions. One is to Eshkol Nevin, one is to Asaf Kavon. I haven't read your book, but I will buy it now. Uh, I, but how did you get the ideas? I, I'm so interested in your books, and we haven't talked so much about your books, about these crazy people, the kibbutzniks, and how they moved to the the religious uh, um, settlement. How, how did you uh, um, how did you think when you wrote about it? I think the characters in the book are so fascinating. Thank you. So I'll just explain. It's uh, my my novel called The Hilltop, that was published in Swedish and, uh, as Lizzie said, is available in ebook uh, now. Um, and I, I'll just answer briefly. I was interested in the settler story, being an Israeli who, who is very far, very removed from, from the settlements, lives in Tel Aviv, I'm a secular, I don't believe in, in holding the, the West Bank, uh, but those people influenced my life. It's a small group of people, and this, there was something that still is very fascinating about their passion and their ideals, and they seem like from a different era. Um, and they live in this very violent um, area. Yeah, so the main characters are, are in the settlement. One of them is a settler, the other visits him or arrives at his doorstep, surprise, uh, surprisingly. Uh, 
And I, I do take them back to their childhood in the kibbutz, later in Tel Aviv, also there are parts in Tel Aviv, and in America also. And um, I, at some point, I think I, I, I realized that it's not only about the settlement itself. It's, it's, it's the story of Israel. And the way Israel uh, arrived at this point where the settlers are kind of hijacking the story and holding it at the throat is the story of, of, of the different structures and di different layers of Israeli history and Israeli kind of um, placement over, uh, over the years. And, and there are different Israels. So I wanted to tell those those stories as well, the story of the kibbutz earlier, the story of, of Tel Aviv, and so on. And, and also, technically, as a writer, I needed an outsider to tell the story. For me, being an outsider, and for most of the readers who are not settlers, whether in Sweden or in Tel Aviv, that um, I think it's easier to, to infiltrate a world with a character who's like an agent coming from the outside. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. Just a sec, I have to. Wanted to ask me a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, well, I have a question. I'm, I'm a writer myself and also a teacher in creative writing. Um, I've been thinking of, I, I briefly met Emma Thos, uh a year ago in Tel Aviv, and uh, we talked about mothers. Um, for the first 20 minutes, he went on this very beautiful, I wouldn't call it a rant, but a beautiful um, and very efficient uh, talk about uh, Israel and uh, how to be an Israeli writer and to be an Israeli person living in Israel today. But after having done so, we talked about mothers. I. I was writing, I am writing a book about my mother, and I asked him if he could uh, give me some advice. Um, and he did. But I was actually so starstruck, I couldn't remember a single word when I was sitting in the taxi going back with my brother to Yaffa. I said, you, You're so smart. I said to my brother, You must remember everything he said. He said, I can't remember anything. I just want to pee. Um, so that sort of disappeared. But I was thinking, Amos Oz was a person who could definitely divide his life between the political and, uh, and fiction. But um, I think he did that very successfully. But for a person like Edgar Keret, whom I don't want to say anything bad about when he's not here, but I'm thinking his writing is also very political, but only from the corner of his eye. It's like the political is there, but from a side. The question is, isn't it so that you as writers has to stay in that zone and not become diplomats or, or um, um, I mean, can't you talk about the political but from a fiction po point of view? Isn't that possible or is that still a struggle? Well. <laughs> I'll try to answer both questions. The question you haven't asked about where do you get your ideas from and your question about being political or non-political. Um, one of my books, uh, Three Floors Up, started in my mind when my driving license was taken away from me. I did too much felonies and you get there's a knock on the door and someone tells you for three months now you can't drive the car. I don't know how it goes in Sweden, but same. So then I got back to using public transportation in Israel. Now, I don't know how many of you have used the bus or the train in Israel, but people in the public transportation in Israel do not behave like Swedish people <laughs> on the train. They are not quite polite reading the newspaper. They talk out very very loud on their cell phones. Now this, for me, was the best time as a storyteller in my life. Because in these three months, I have heard amazing story. And now I'm coming back to your question. 
because I heard people talking out loud on the phone uh, about their girlfriend has just dumped them. I want to get married, but I, I have, I'm, I'm about to be married in a couple of days. That's another story. I, I'm about to be married in a couple of days. I want to cancel the marriage. <laughs> Family disputes, uh, money disputes, everything is out in the open. People are talking and I'm listening and thinking to myself, this is my next novel. <laughs> this is about conflicts and, and why Israel is such a triggering place. And also you hear political discussions. You hear uh, people talking about military operations in their cellular phone, <laughs> in the open, and when it's going to begin, when it's going to end. And you can't make this division in Israel. The po political is personal, the personal is political. You can't, I, I don't go on thinking, hmm, am I a political person or am I a non-political person? Should I be uh, dividing myself from political activity, it's combined. You can't, you can't differentiate. When I wrote the book based on this three months of uh, uh, not driving or, or enjoying the Israeli public transportation, uh, when I eventually wrote it, it was about emotional, personal uh, issues regarding family and couplehood, but it was also about demonstrations and violence that you mentioned before, this, this very, this undertow of violence you can always feel walking in Tel Aviv or in any other place in, in Israel. It was also about being a man in Israel, being a, a, an ex-military, an ex-officer. Does an Israeli man ever leaves the army behind him? Or you are always a soldier in a way. It was also about this. So. I don't see any point in, in, in dividing it. I, I do try, when I write about, when I write literature, I try to uh, write about things I have a question mark regarding them. If I'm very, very sure about something, I will write a political essay, which I do. But if I have a question, I will, I will try to uh, investigate it with a story. Maybe now, before we go to Noah that will show you, you know, some minutes from the television version of her novel, just a remark that will bring us back to questions that were asked here about politics and non-politics, and to Tel Aviv, and to Eshkol. In one of Eshkol's novels, there is a very nice scene that refers to, I think, many questions around us and to Tel Aviv. It's about a woman who is coming to Tel Aviv uh, in the time of the public, uh, the, the uh, economic uh, protest in, in uh, uh, Rothschild Boulevard, and she's going there and she's interested. And you know, at that time, there were many, many tents. There was a tent of psychologists, because psychologists in the public sphere in Israel, I don't know how it's here, are really very badly paid, and they protested. That their way of protest was they made a tent and they said to everybody, you know, for free, do you need a psychological therapy? Come in. It's, a true, it's a true story, by it's the a way. True it's story. based on a true story. <laughs> and she says, why not? And she's entering, and then she begins to tell her very personal psychological problems, and she gets treatment. And Eskol says, maybe Tel Aviv is where a place, is a, such a place where the borderline between the very personal and the very public is blurred. The movie. I'll just give uh, <coughs> the background and we'll solve the mystery of why um, the novel is called Stockholm. Uh, the novel is about uh, five friends who are 70 years old. They have been friends for dozens of years. One of them is a well-known world-renowned uh, professor of economics, which is, uh, which, is which is named as one of the prominent uh, optional people to win the Nobel Prize in economics, and especially in that year where the book takes place in. They say that this is his year, and he's gonna get the Nobel Prize in economics. But unfortunately, eight days before the announcement of the Nobel Prize, He's, he has a heart attack, and he dies. 
And since he lives alone, he doesn't have a family, his friends find his body. And a minute before they start working out the funeral arrangements, uh, one of them has an idea. At first, he brings it up as a joke. He says, well, what if we don't tell anyone that he died? It's only eight days. It's October. It's kind of cold, you know? And then we will give him the option to win the thing that he wanted more than anything and to be engraved in eternity. And as you probably all know, uh, you cannot win the Nobel Prize if you're dead. You have to be alive at the time of the announcement. You can die be between the announcement and the ceremony. There is no problem. But you have to be die uh, alive at the time of the announcement. So uh, after a lot of deliberation, they decide to go, go ahead and do that. They say, how difficult can it be? He lives alone. Just answer a few text messages on his cell phone. Of course, it turns out that it's much more difficult than they expected. First of all, because things tend to be more difficult than you expect. And second of all, because otherwise there wouldn't be a novel and there wouldn't be a series. <laughs> so what we're going to watch now is uh, what happens is they keep, they do, um, they watch over his body. They do shifts watching over his body. Uh, when suddenly uh, the deceased sister comes over to the house, it turns out that she sleeps over at her brother's house once every week. And they understand that they have to move the body from the deceased's house to one of the friend's house. So this is what we're going to watch now. Yael will present the film of her father. I will ask one question, we'll show the film, and then we are here to answer questions. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming to, to help this screening to see the film. I'm not that verbal as my colleagues here because I'm coming from another discipline which is not too much verbal, so I will read the text. So forgive me for that and then uh, we will begin. Okay, I take my glasses. When I begin, I will I just uh, I will bring some words of my father in order to begin. So my father said in one interview when I began shooting diary, 15 years ago, when he was interviewed, I had only one precise aim, to create something other than professional cinema. I simply wanted to make films after several years when all my proposals had met with refusals. The situation seemed hopeless. The more the Israeli cinema involved, the more my professional life seemed in decline. Why? Was it the xenophobia? against an immigrant in a land of immigrants, in a land of promise. I didn't know. A diary. How can one film an authentic diary? I had never seen such a thing. In May 1973, I bought a small 16 millimeter camera. I wanted to film for myself, by myself, in complete anonymity. I wanted to approach the everyday, <clears throat> to focus my camera on my own home. What I can add from my own experience as his daughter and as the editor of this film, that diary is not a spontaneous work and it is not what the French call journal intime. My father didn't like striptease. The shooting and the editing was not arbitrary at all there was a strict choice of the subject and a long process in the editing. I remember the importance my father attached to editing, his precision and discipline. In the narration, and this is for the writers among us, in the narration, he fought with the words to find exact terms or to cover up what he didn't want to be over explicit. Throughout the film, there is, there, um, there is, he expresses his artistic awareness regarding what he is trying to do and the theoretic conception of the formal aspects of the film. He asks questions. Am I making a home movie? Am I being a reporter? I avoid intrigues and drama, but what should I do when they force themselves into my camera. 
the last things I would like to, to read is in this part, I think it's the very important part of the first chapter and for all diary is, the making of this, this film is also conceived as a political act. The expression that my father wrote in his narration was to film through my window as through a window of a tank carries a military connection to the time of the war where the scenes were shot, but it is above all a political attitude regarding his own professional work as a filmmaker. In other words, it seems metaphorically he is speaking of a personal struggle with a new wave way of film editing. When showing this film 40 years after it was made, I have the feeling that I understand better what my father said when he decided to enter upon this long journey. The documentary cinema does not interest me anymore. Unless I can deal with it in a poetic way, it is only then the cinema interests me. So I think that we will just one question and we will begin. I want to firstly to, to tell you that this is my father. I don't know, I don't think that we mentioned it, so nice to meet my father. He's there and as you see, he's shooting Tel Aviv. We lived on the 14th floor and this uh, picture was uh, taken during the 80s. He loved the city, he loved snooker. During the 60s, he played snooker at the beach, in the clubs. And I was born in Tel Aviv, at the center of Tel Aviv, so I'm the very Tel Avivian. And uh, just to put some uh, uh, words about the beginning of diary, it begins through the window. And I think the most important sentences written in the diary connected to his way of seeing through the window in our apartment in Tel Aviv. Uh, so, nice screening, yeah. You said, you quoted your father saying, I'm shooting as if it is the window of a tank. Now, this brings one of major issue that was here in the last session too. You can't live Israeli life without making a mixture of the very personal, a diary that deals with himself, with his family. You'll see the young, the elder and others. And at the same time, you'll see the 73 war you'll see very serious public life. Now, how you father, you think, so the, this mixture of personal life and public life and war life in Tel Aviv. What was the meaning of Tel Aviv for him? He was, it was part of him to look from Tel Aviv. Tell us, maybe can by and, and you can add, this is not the one and only film about Tel Aviv. Yeah. He made other films about Tel Aviv. Maybe you can yeah. deliberate about it a little. Uh, it happens to be that the first apartment that the uh, diary uh, was shot was, uh, we lived in front of a synagogue. And uh, it was during the war, the Yom Kippur war, and my father just saw that, that the people were taking out to the army, to the reserve. It was a surprise. Uh, surprise. surprise. So this is short, you will see it in the film. And I think the word is contemplation. I believe that contemplation is the word also for literature and also, of course, for cinema. Uh, I just can give you some sentence about another film, a very short film, a reportage. He loved reportage. He decided to make a reportage about one street in Tel Aviv called Yavne Street. And uh, there he, he just uh, followed the numbers of the street and he just jumped into scenes in every number. So it begins with the mikveh, you know, because it was, uh, as he told me once, the story is just around the corner. I think that Eshkol said the same thing. I mean, we are, you just have to, to watch, to open your eyes and you find the story. So I wish you, I wish, you enjoy the screening and I will be there to answer you. Be careful, I'm very young in the film. <laughs> and don't, don't be shocked. She was <laughs> okay. In the lens of poverty and illiteracy, those who couldn't sign their names had two crosses marked on their photographs. Name and surname.
May 1973. I buy a camera. I want to start filming by myself and for myself. Professional cinema does no longer attract me. To look for something else, I want to approach the everyday. Above all, in anonymity. It takes time to learn how to do it. My first shot, my second, I live on the third floor, a good height. I add sound. The synagogue to the right, the balconies opposite. I have an urge to turn round point my camera indoors, into my own home. Even now, I don't know how Mira managed, in one shot, to change her dress so quickly and come back. <laughs> Yael and Naomi. I filmed the active angles of my house. The corner, even Gvirol Street and its arcades. Yael. The warm soup is tempting, but I know I must choose from now on. To eat the soup or to film the soup. Yael, good morning. Both of us in the mirror, at different angles. Naomi is at ease with my observing her. She has just exchanged the trumpet she played so well for dancing. Dancing means cucumbers, lettuce, yogurt, a strict diet. My twins, I want to see them as separate beings, but for a while, I filmed them in the same shot. Yael? Now me. Yael, please. Uh, if there are questions, we'll be glad to answer. Uh, maybe I'll say something. Uh, I had many conversations with David. I really loved him, not only as a filmmaker. Um, once he told me, you know, cinema has a problem. In literature, there are times you can say I'm doing, you can say I did yesterday, and you can say I will do. In cinema, it's always present. Really? Yeah, it's always present. There is only one time. Now, when he said that, it came to my mind that people used to say that Tel Aviv has no feeling of history. Go to Jerusalem. There, are, there is a lot of history. Tel Aviv is no feeling of how deep is Jewish life, how deep is Jewish history. And I thought that David was master of time. Diary, first of all, is today and tomorrow and yesterday. And he managed to look from the window of the tank of his apartment but to show us the many, many, many elements of time from Tel Aviv, not from, he, he visited Jerusalem, but from Tel Aviv, because you can see personal time, his daughter, his wife, you can see war, war. you can see 
the consequence of war, Sadat is coming. You can see him going back to Paris and taking his daughter back. You can see friends coming and they are singing in Portuguese. Yeah, because he was from Brazil. So you can fill time. And you can fill time without the conventions of time. What is the historical story? You watch it, David, and you say, let's be fresh about what is the historical story. When Sadat is coming, for instance, he goes to a film that makes his student, that shows the victims of the war, the suffering of the war. So I feel that David was a great master of time, and especially in Tel Aviv. Do you think about this idea, this element? Yes. <laughs> in editing, he, was, he wanted to go, to go in time, back and forth? I will tell you the process of editing, okay? Yeah. That I think that will interest you. The film uh, was shot in, um, in, t in terms of time, three minutes and 10 seconds each. Uh, the camera was Canon Scopic. It was the camera that was invented for the war in Vietnam. It was used for the first time in the war in Vietnam. And uh, it was uh, used for reportage, okay? So my father bought this camera, which was cheap, and he could charge, charge, uh, charge, put films in uh, uh, 100 feet, which means three minutes and 10 seconds. And in this, he made six hours, which means the camera was not synchron, there was no sound, and the editing was the same. I edit everything mute. I didn't know the, uh, what would be not the sync sound and not, of course, the commentary. The commentary came much later. It was written in Portuguese, because it was his language. It was then translated to English, because while editing the film Channel 4 during the 80s, that it was just constructed, they put some money in the film, so it was translated from Portuguese to English. My mother is an English teacher. Ten years later, it was translated to Hebrew. While my father lived in Israel all his life, in Tel Aviv, I mean, he arrived to Israel from Brazil uh, in the 50s, and all his life he spent in, in Tel Aviv was his house. I mean, we we're very connected to Tel Aviv. So the Hebrew version came, it was the same length, but it came much later, 10 years later. So this was concerning the editing, the commentary came only at the end, which means after two years. While editing it, I had no idea what would be the sentences. And I was very young, I was 21 years old, and I didn't dare ask him. So I enjoyed it. I learned my, my profession then. But uh, when the, uh, the sentences arrived, I was very shocked. This I can tell you. For example, just as, a, I mean, the very first sentences, I had no idea. I edited one balcony, another balcony. I had no idea that it would be so much charged with meanings. So for you, the writers, I think it's interesting to know how words can add to, to a shot. I mean, even this uh, joke at the beginning, I don't think, yeah, it's funny, the word, I, didn't, I couldn't imagine how my mother changed dress. You know, one student of mine asked me, no, it's a special effect, why well, why he says it? I mean, uh, how can it be that in one shot he, cha he changed? So these were the, the process of editing. I don't know if he himself knew while editing what would be the final sentences. I knew that sometimes he just vanished in one room and began writing. Uh, the man who just worked with him was Nathan Zach, the poet. They were very close friends, so I know that they worked together. I think he pushed it for more poetic ways. I don't know. I just discovered lately the papers, and I saw the handwriting of Nathan Zach in this, and the correction, which is completely interesting. But it was written in English, not in Hebrew, and in, in Portuguese, English, and then Hebrew. So this is concerning time. It took yeah. time, and I want you also to understand that the process was not editing also. We ran from the balcony, we ran to the editing room, and then I ran to the lab putting the, the film to be developed, and then I went down to demonstration, 
So it was a whole a complete uh, a, a process of working for years. Without, nobody knew. I don't think that he knew what will be the end of it. It was six hours because Channel 4 entered and Channel 4 wanted uh, to screen every day a chapter. So if, as there is six days a week, so he said, yes, I will make it six hours. So that's why we have six hours. Sometimes life brings you the facts. Yeah, did I answer you or yeah, not? Yeah, yeah. In a way, answer. This is <laughs> many levels of time of filming, of editing, of history, of wars, of demonstrations. And Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv. Okay. Any uh, any other question? So we we'll thank you very much for this you. lovely afternoon. You. You're a great audience. And we want to thank Lizzie for organizing all this and putting so much work and inviting us.